Good afternoon. Thank you to Arun for the invitation to address the American Society of Missiology as part of an annual meeting examining hybridity in mission. It's an honor to join you as an outsider, and I look forward to our conversations between fields at the meeting. Um, also, thank you to Arun, Jennifer, and to others whose invisible labor made this virtual conversation possible. And thank you all in advance for our conversation. I just want to pause for a second to now share my screen. Okay. I've been working on a small book about Latinx religious hybridity and religious pluralism. Overall, I argue that Latinas, Latinos, and Latinx confront, challenge, but also embrace the categories of religion and race in ways that complicate dominant religious studies narratives about the modern invention of religion as a category. Today, I will briefly summarize framing problems that beset scholarly examination of religion at large, as well as religious hybridity in Latina perspective. Since my time with you today is short, um, I thought I might actually just give you a concrete clip to play around with. This clip is from December 2018 of then Congresswoman-elect Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, or AOC, as she's popularly dubbed because of her Twitter handle. She's Catholic, but she made headlines uh, in that particular week for a brief speech she was invited to give at a Hanukkah lighting event sponsored by Jews for Racial and Economic Justice in Queens, New York. She has since also uh, described the ecumenical context of her, her childhood. Um, but as you watch this clip, pay attention to how AOC talks about her family's religious, ethnic, and racial identities and heritage. People don't know about Puerto Rico, and one of the things that we discovered about ourselves is that very, a very, very long time ago, generations and generations ago, my family uh, consisted of Sephardic Jews. Oh. And it is like, <laughs> 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 I told you. <laughs> I knew it. I sensed it. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the story, you know, the story goes is uh, during the Spanish Inquisition, uh, so many people were forced to convert on the exterior to Catholicism, but on the interior continued to practice their faith, continued to be who they were, even though they were pressured to not be that on the outside world. And a strong group of people, strong wills that were, were determined to continue living life as they wanted to live it, decided to get on a boat and leave Spain. And some of those people landed in Puerto Rico. And some of those people decided to flee up into the mountains. And as is the story of Puerto Rico, we are a people that, that are an amalgamation. We are no one thing. We are black, we are indigenous, we are Spanish, we are European. Uh, we, we are all of these things. And, uh, and to think about that, to think about how the culture in Puerto Rico was that people would open their closets and there would be a small menorah inside. And then, uh, and then as they had children and their children had children uh, and their children's children, children had children. Um, these cultures started to kind of mix and blend in a way that many people in those subsequent generations didn't understand, you know, to practice Catholicism on the exterior, but then when you're at home to practice Judaism in the interior, meanwhile, you're on an island that has a African animism, indigenous spirituality, all of these things start to just amalgamate into something new, something different, and something, something entirely distinct. And, um, and so there were people that were like, okay, well, I think I'm Catholic, but we've got a menorah at home, and uh, we have Palo Santo, and we use that to, to clear our rooms, and whatever. And so I think what it really goes to show is that so many of our destinies are tied. The video cut off, but she concludes by saying, quote, so many of our destinies are tied beyond our understanding, end quote. You can imagine some people found Ocasio-Cortez's statements problematic, so she further clarified her perspective on Twitter. Oh, sorry. Um, and I want to share her tweets because I think they further demonstrate some of the tensions that come up in the study of uh, Latinx religious pluralism. The first tweet, quote, culture isn't DNA, but to be Puerto Rican is to be the descendant of African Moors and slaves, Taino Indians, Spanish colonizers, Jewish refugees, and likely others. 
We are all these things and something else all at once. We are Bodhiqua, end quote. Then second tweet, uh, just because one concrete identity may not be how we think of ourselves today, nor how we were raised, it doesn't mean we cannot or should not honor the ancestors and stories that got us here. I was raised Catholic and that identity is an amalgam too, especially in Latin America, end quote. And then I will return to her third tweet uh, at the conclusion of the conversation. As in her speech in the synagogue, AOC mobilizes categories of religion and race, but she also complicates them by grounding them in Puerto Rican history. In some ways, AOC's discussion of her particular Puerto Rican family narrative helps point us toward larger themes, the way that Latinx religious contexts are constituted by diversity and difference. As she says, to be Boricua is to also be many things. As an aside, I should say that the first problem of this study is really an issue with defining Latines, but I don't have time to discuss that today, though I'm happy to do so in the Q&A. What I do want to underscore here in broad strokes is that Latinx stories can complicate dominant definitions of religion in part because of the memory of colonialism that frames religion as a category. However, Latinx contexts themselves may have been overly dominated by narratives of mixture that present their own challenges, particularly when encoded with a linear, straight temporality focused on both origins and destinations. Nevertheless, in AOC's third tweet, there may be an understanding of hybridity that disrupt, disrupts a neat linear temporality. So first, starting with um, thinking about uh, religion. For the past 30 years or so, scholars of religion have complicated our, our sense of religion as a category, troubling dominant cultural assumptions that belief must necessarily constitute the central defining rubric of religion. Moreover, scholars have demonstrated that our notion of what constitutes a religion have been produced over centuries of conflict in which Christians have dominated many other groups. Um, here, I am thinking about work on the late ancient world, such as Daniel Boyarin's Borderlines, but I'm also thinking of Talal Assad and his examinations of how European Christians and their diasporas circumscribed the category of religion and modernity because of conflict uh, and convergence. Um, and that we see religion especially emerging out of Europe and uh, Euro diasporic colonialism's violent interactions around the world, um, and where we've seen missionaries and the nascent academic field of anthrop anthropology often being deeply intertwined with colonial histories. In looking at AOC's remarks, we might first notice the total absence of belief in her narrative of religious heritage. AOC identifies quite clearly as Catholic. Yet how she defines that term and how she understands faith more generally is not at all focused around belief. She articulates Jewish faith as a way of life that people struggled to maintain. Cuban American theologian Orlando Espin has also depicted Christianity in Latinx context as first and foremost a way of life. Akin to Espin's emphasis on traditioning, AOC's discussion of religious pluralities are generally grounded in concrete practices, i.e. manoras and palo santo, not in texts or dogma. AOC offers a complement to, if also a complication of, narratives like Assad's about what religion is. Now, other scholars might ask, well, what constitutes religion as a distinctive category, if not belief? Indeed, religion may not stand very well as a distinctive category on its own, but we might also see how notions of religion and the religious get produced in relations between people and in relationship to other forms of categorization. In this case, AOC does not focus on a singular conscious intention or a temporality of origin rooted in the clashing beliefs of practitioners. She focuses on people and the things people do. She describes everyday practices that have come together because of the ways people have come together and built multi-generational communities, creating what she calls an amalgamation. But her idea might be more akin to a form of bricolage. The temporality that becomes apparent in AOC's narrative, however, risks remaining linear with a potentially progressive telos. 
Now, as others have argued, teleological narratives of hybridity may reproduce some of the perils too often associated with discourses of syncretism. The positing of pure originals that makes into something new, a product that either represents a fall from the pure original or that represents a better path than at least one of the sources. I have some hope that we can read AOC as somewhat disruptive here. Her narrative of the past, of the past does not fetishize pure originals, and it seems more concerned with the dynamics of power that shaped amalgam amalgamation, specifically the colonial production of race and ethnicity. Here, I would suggest that AOC speaks to a theme quite common in Latinx analyses of religion, even among those who reject religion. Latinas, Latinos, and Latines experience religious pluralism and religious hybridity as a factor in everyday life that is a product of histories of imperial and settler colonial violence, a product of the violent application of dominant categories and the ways people survived and refashioned those categories in daily life. So in her speech, uh, AOC discussed how her Sephardic Jewish ancestors came to Puerto Rico because of a violent delineation of what it means to be Spanish. After a period of living together under Muslim rule, which provides another matrix of thinking about histories of Latinx religious pluralism and hybridity, Jews and Muslims were expelled from Christian Iberia. Some hid themselves in their traditions in the Americas, fearing death at the hands of the Inquisition. At the same time, indigenous populations and their religious traditions were also targeted for genocide and assimilation under Iberian rule and kidnapped and enslaved African peoples and their traditions were similarly prescribed as violence. Moreover, as Spain and Portugal expanded their imperial power into the Pacific and onto the Asian continent, they also abducted peoples in parts of Asia, enslaved them, and brought them to the Americas. These histories of colonial violence pervade AOC's family narrative. And she underscores the ongoing presence of all these histories and the continuing survival of all these peoples. They are not neatly relegated to the past. Yet AOC doesn't just narrate violence. She describes her Puerto Rican identity through an attention to destiny, to the present outcomes and the futurities that may be possible because of these pasts. Specifically, she describes a something new that came out of multi-generational mixture. So here though is a problem. These themes of amalgamation and futurity bring me to my third point. Latinas, Latinos, and Latines may problematize categories of religion, race, and ethnicity as they have been described in dominant English-speaking contexts. Uh, a framework, um, especially in white English-speaking contexts, that is too often but not always underscored notions of purity and a mind-body dichotomy. False notions of pure religious pasts, uh, false emphases on intentions and beliefs that can be neatly separated from lived realities. English writing on religion for too long separated religion from race instead of grappling deeply with how these categories were forged together and in relationship in modernity. However, recent works like Maria, Maria Elena Martinez's work on genealogical fictions or Sylvester Johnson's work on African-American religions from 1500 to 2000 are but two examples of recent correctives in the English language. Yet despite the ways that Latinx narratives often complicate dominant, i.e. US white depictions of religious identities, Latinx contexts have been dominated by their own straightening temporal narrative just one that emphasizes the image of familial production of a future that must look better than the past, a hybrid future that is imagined as better than some of the original quote unquote past. There is a problematic phrasing in Spanish that who's too often underscored dominant Latinx narratives of racial and religious mixture. That phrasing is mejorar la raza or to improve the people. Now, one dominant framework in Latin American self-narratives of hybridity is called mestizaje, a term that can mean many different things in a variety of contexts, as Guatemalan Canadian theologian Nestor Medina um, describes in his book on mestizaje. However, Medina also demonstrates how discourses of racial mixture developed in much of Latin America in ways that structurally maintained European settler colonial dominance, whatever work they did challenging no notions of purity. 
So on this slide, you see two examples of what uh, were termed Casta paintings. They are fantastical representations of colonial Latin America, especially of Mexico and Peru during the 18th century. They were made in the New World, but for Spanish consumption, many of them can be found in the Museo de América in Madrid today. Um, and they try to impose a narrative order on a new world that was viewed as too chaotic, too out of control. A lot more could be said about these paintings and their lack of accuracy, but they reveal a teleology of hybridity, especially the way that Mestiza is a mixed identity generally represented in the top left image in each painting. Um, it's a mixed identity produced through a fantasy of heteropatriarchal familial relations. A Spanish father and an indigenous mother have a Mestiza child. And then in the next image, this Mestiza child should ideally then go on to marry a Spaniard. And after a few generations, indigenous peoples are disappeared as their children marry toward whiteness. A clear settler colonial ideology is marked here and a clear white supremacist one too, with a goal of eradicating indigenous peoples through reproduction and assimilation into a whiteness that will dominate the space. African descended identities and Asian identities are also presented here in troublesome ways that I can discuss further in the Q&A, but the lesson of the colonial logics of these paintings is that mixture is good in as much as it promises movement toward European Christian domains. The appearance of Guadalupe in the, in the one painting as a Christian symbol could be indicative of the ways that even beloved symbols of religious hybridity can be used to encode white Christian domination. The attention to indigenous uses of Guadalupe could also open up a path of disruption of this white supremacist and heteropatriarchal ideology. I could discuss that later. There are more than 200 years that separate this colonial vision of mestizaje and AOC's narrative. And there are important intervening histories that have complicated Latinx narratives of hybridity. Moreover, AOC reflects Boricua rather than Mexican identity and Puerto Rico has its own myths of mixture. But if we think about AOC's tweets, she only alludes to Muslims as Moors and the Asian diaspora is absent from her history of Puerto Rican amalgamation. Spanish colonizers are not explicitly identified as Catholics and Jewish refugees are not identified as Spanish. She recognizes the import of African ancestry uh, though a more traditional Puerto Rican myth of the mixing of three cultures still presumes an ultimate disappearing of indigenous and African traditions, even as it includes them in the national myth of identity, but they become part of something new, another amalgamation. Pointedly in her speech, AOC describes all these peoples as having come together into something new. Her ancestors' practices survived, but their identities have been subsumed into a Catholic amalgamation. The logics of settler colonialism may still dominate as those who have been colonized are now lumped into this imagination. Yet in her tweet, AOC depicts a ancestral hybridity as a place from which one can see how destinies connect across difference, where, quote, our future is tightly knit with other communities, end quote. As a counterpoint, I want to suggest that there might be a possibility of narrating hybrid futures as something other than the amalgamation into something new that AOC described in a previous tweet. Perhaps there are ways of narrating hybridity so as to refuse the straightening logics of a linear hater, heteropatriarchal and white supremacist framework. Um, so what I want to suggest sort of by way of a, a kind of concluding turn is in is turning instead of to the notion of amalgamation turning to what afro puerto rican feminist yomaira c figueroa vasquez describes as a notion of apocalypso which she expands upon from the writings of jamaican author michelle cliff by focusing on what figueroa vasquez describes as quote afro syncretic practices of decolonial love in quote found in the Gumi traditions, Figueroa Vasquez underscores hybrid traditions crafted under dominant logics of mestizaje, but disruptive of their teleological linear temporality. Like AOC, Figueroa Vasquez emphasizes practice over belief because of the ways that embodied ritual practice can make possible apocalypso, 
a portmanteau of apocalypse and calypso where quote the other becomes the one end quote apocalypso is a form of hybridity narrated not as amalgamation but as rupture as that form of hybridity that disrupts our capacity to control meaning a rupture that opens up quote world slash otherwise end quote for figueroa vasquez quote decolonial love in world slash otherwise manifests as attention to 1492 the past before it the past since the subterranean roots created by it and the dead beneath the sea it can be imagined as looking into the vast and inconsolable sea to make visible what was disappeared and make futurities beyond coloniality perceptible end quote Despite some of the problems in AOC's narrative, it also might be possible to see AOC's speech in the synagogue and her third tweet in particular as offering an alternative to the linear progress from a disappeared past into a new amalgamation. In that third tweet, AOC states, quote, if anything, the stories of our ancestry give us windows of opportunity to lean into others, to seek them out and see ourselves, our histories and our futures tightly knit with other communities in a way we perhaps never before thought possible, end quote. Here, AOC emphasizes relational productions rather than a static amalgamation or a disappeared past. Ancestral stories are presented as apocalypso, connections forged in ways that exceed our ability to narrate them simply. Perhaps there is the possibility of apocalypso, a refusal of binary formulations of difference, an interruption of linear temporalities, a glimpse at world slash otherwise that neither neatly move on from the past nor simply orient toward a future beyond. My hope today was to underscore certain tensions I'm grappling with while studying religious hybridity in Latinx contexts, but I'm excited to see how this work both aligns with and can be further complicated by the attention to mission, especially as the description of this annual meeting also refused binary logics or neat temporalities in its description of missionaries who, quote, may have their origins in more than one community and locale go to places that are marked by profound internal diversity and combine with differing degrees of facility, distinct, even competing mission ideologies, goals, and practices, end quote. I look forward to our conversation during the Q&A. Thank you.